All right, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, as we look at this, uh, it's uh, Daniel 12 is a continuation of the, the vision, the prophecy that was given to him starting in chapter 11. And so, uh, you know, we could have taken it all at once, but I'm glad we didn't. Uh, so we're going to start uh, by just reading the first four verses as we kind of connect to that which uh, belongs to chapter 11. So now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people uh, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, in, in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So again, we're, we're continuing from chapter 11. And, and he, says, he says, now, at that time, so it begins with this reference to what he's been saying previously, which was all about the activity of the Antichrist in the last days. The end of time, uh, we'll see the rise of this person uh, that we saw previously, we saw as a type, this this. This past leader was a type was Antiochus Epiphanes, but in the future we will see this great and terrible leader, the Antichrist. So it says, uh, at that time, Michael, uh, the great prince, will arise. Uh, so that's the first thing we have really to look at here is the idea of the great prince. Uh, Michael's role uh, it seems to be kind of made a little bit more clear. Uh, with all the study of the angels, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and, and we get bits here and there of uh, who the angels are and what they do. We know that they're created beings. We know that they're messengers of God. They, they interact with humans uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, Michael here, it, it, it seems as though he's the guardian I angel of Israel. Like, look at the language. Um, he's the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, the, the sons of Daniel's people. That's Israel. And so there we go. Michael has this position uh, as guardian, you know, not a guardian of the galaxy, but a guardian over the nation, God's people. And it says he will arise. Now, he's not sleeping. He's not laying down. The, the idea here is, is, is that he's, he's going to arise. Some of the translations, I, th say, I think they say he's going to stand up. It really isn't, it has, doesn't have to do with him standing or sitting. It has to do with him taking action. That's the point that he's given us. He's, he's going to take some action. The thing that we've seen over and over again is, is that there is there's some warfare alluded to in, the, in the, the, the angelic realm, in the heavens. There's, there is a battle. There's a cosmic spiritual battle that's going on. And Michael is involved in it in, on behalf of the nation. We see a little bit more of this in Revelation chapter 12. In verse 7, it says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. There's a battle. And the, the dragon is Satan. It's the devil. There's, a, there's this incredible, great battle that's going on. And, and Michael is battling on behalf of God's people, Israel. In verse 17, it gives us a little bit more information. It says, the dragon was enraged with the woman. And went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Well, if you read Revelation chapter 12, the context is given to us. The woman referenced there in verse 17 is Israel. And so here's what you see. The dragon, the devil, is enraged and he's going after 
God's people, Israel. You know what? This, is, this has been since the beginning of time, hasn't it? It's like there's no other people, there's no other nation, there's no other group of people like the Jews. Even today, if you, if you look at the situation in the world and all the different wars, so much of it is focused, certainly today, so much of it is focused on Israel. Because the enemies that are all around that nation, they have one goal, they have one desire, and that is to eradicate these people. It's an ancient and demonically inspired jealousy. There's a battle going on. Now, what we see in, in this time that we're going to be looking at in the last days, there's, it's judgment. There is a judgment, a future judgment that's coming on the nation of Israel. But in, in the sense that God is judging his people, he is also at the same time not seeking to destroy them. Right? God is not seeking to destroy them, but to discipline them. We're not told everything about this great war. But here's one of the things that I, I, I think is important for us to keep in mind. When we bow our heads to pray, we're entering into the battle. Like in, in the sense of, of the spiritual battle that's going on, whether we're, we're talking about that nation or our nation or your neighbor, you need to know there is a battle going on. And, and, and in, in the sense here in our text, we see that the battle has to do with the nation, but the, the battle always has to do with salvation. It always has to do with the, the soul of people, literally people. And, and you should keep that in mind. When you pray, you're entering into battle. It should, it should change the way you pray. Maybe the, the intensity or the, the, the fervency that you have in your prayers. As you seek God on behalf of, you know, whether it's individuals or nations or whatever situation, the, the enemy wants to destroy, God wants to save. It's a time, as we see in our text, it's a time of great distress. There will be, it says, there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. Now, we, we understand this from so many other texts. We understand that the reference here is to the tribulation, the seven-year period of tribu tribulation. But even more specifically, the second half of, a seven, of the seven year period of tribulation is what's in view here. And it's not just isolated here to this prophecy in Daniel. All through the scriptures, this time is referenced in like manner. In Matthew 24, Jesus is answering the question, Lord, what's it going to be like when you return? Right? That was the, the disciples wanted to know. Lord, at the end of the age, what's that going to be like? What's it going to be like when you return? And Jesus said, amongst other things, he said in Matthew 24, 21, there will be a great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Now, a lot of people read these things and they go, oh, yeah, that's what happened in A.D. 70 when, you know, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. Well, read it again. There's never going to be anything like it. And then you read it in the context of Daniel this, he's talking about at the end. It's at the end of time that this will happen. If you recall the, the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9, it's this, you know, it's the 69 per years, these, the 69 periods of time, they, they've, they've already been done. We're waiting for this last seven year period of time. And as I said before, it's, it's judgment for God's people. Like Daniel's now, he's seen the end of this 70-year period of the Babylonian captivity. That was discipline. Israel was being disciplined for their, their stubbornness and for their, their not following God's word. This last seven-year period is the same in the sense that it's judgment on the nation, but not for destruction. It's for chastisement. It's for their rejection of Christ. And it will result, it will result in a refining, as our text makes clear, 
There's going to be this refining or this purging, but there's going to be salvation. I mean, that's one of the really incredible things. And so going back to Daniel chapter 9, it says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, but then also to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision, prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So it's going to bring an end in the sense of judgment. It's going to bring an end to, to discipline on, on the nation. But then it's going to bring in the great hope, everlasting righteousness, which obviously it's Christ himself, but then also the finishing of all prophecy. Jesus told his disciples, as he was talking about this whole thing uh, in Matthew 24, he said it's going to be like birth pangs. Like you guys have read that, right? You're familiar with that term. He says all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Well, if you read Matthew 24 or Mark chapter 13, where you know, this, is, uh, this dialogue is, is given to us, He's talking about the wars and rumors of wars. He's talking about the, the, the famines and earthquakes and, and just natural disasters. All these difficult things are going to be happening in the, on the earth in the last days leading up to this final week. But he says those, those earlier things, they're just the beginning of birth pangs. Now, I like to be really careful when I'm talking about labor and giving birth because I haven't done it but um, it's so funny isn't it that the culture is you know they, they talk about silly things like that that you know at some point men are going to be able to give birth it's like whatever uh, but here's what I know having witnessed it uh, you know at least these four times labor labor comes in waves right in it gradually increases in, in frequency and intensity. Like it starts out, well, again, I'm speaking generally, right? Like, but just, I, rem- I, remember, I remember the first when Abigail was, was we, when Lori was giving birth to Abigail, I remember we were just laying in bed, I think it was a Saturday morning, and it was like, hmm, what was that? She was just like, I, ooh, what was that? You know, it was like this thing, and we were so excited but it was like, this is it. It's, she's coming today. It was the day before Father's Day. It was so fun. But it, but it was it, that, that thing. It, was, it just it starts with maybe with a little flutter. But then it grows. And, and more frequent and more intense. But before that, even before that, many women have this false labor called Braxton Hicks. Where, you know, weeks before, or I, you know, I don't know the timeline of these things, but, but they have these things where it's like, whoa, what's going on? And we're not ready yet. But your body is, is doing this thing, and it seems like you're going into labor. And you're not. It's, it's not the event, right? It's, it's, why, it's why it's called false labor. But it's natural, and it's your body preparing for the real event. Your body begins to prepare for the real event and it's a sign of what's to come. Like, like physically there's something going on, but then psychologically and emotionally, like maybe, I suppose, it could cause great dread, right, of what's to come. But it's also something that's like incredible, incredibly joyful in the sense of there's this expectation. We're going to have a baby. It's a sign, though, of something that's yet to come. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has revealed what we can expect before the event of the tribulation. Again, what are we talking about? We're talking about this great time of trouble, this great time of tribulation. There are things that lead up to it. And when you look at what the text says, what the scripture says, uh, it's, it's hard not to see that we're, we're there, in a sense. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, it says the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit, here Paul's writing, but he says the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Now, we read about that in Thessalonians, that, that before the Antichrist rises, 
before he comes to power, there's going to be a falling away. People are going to abandon the faith. People are going to abandon Christian morality, abandon the teaching of the scriptures. And we're seeing it today, over and over in so many different ways. This church, that church, these leaders, who once, they, they started out well. And then through ego or pride or something, it's like they, they started teaching that which was false. That's why you have to be super careful about what you take in. I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the big areas of influence in the church today is music. And th these groups, are th they teach wacky stuff, and then they're trying to influence the church through their music. It's, it's wrong. But this is part of what's going to be happening in the lead up to the very last days. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes this, chapter 3, verse 1, in the last days, difficult times will come. Hello, 2020, <laughs> 2021. It's like crazy things. Okay, so, so when we read these things, we shouldn't be ignorant. We also need to know that every generation has thought they were in that time. Certainly, we're closer than they were. But here's what it says. In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self. Oh, my goodness. Let me take a selfie right now. Let me take a bunch of selfies of myself. Hey, do you guys want to see some more pictures of me? Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. Hello, kids. Disobedient to, to parents. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. Man, do we see that today? It's like you can't, you can't end an argument. There's no end to our arguments. Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they've denied its power. What you got there is false religion. We have it today, man, I'll tell you, in this whole woke thing. It's like, I'm righteous because of this cause that I support. I have a righteousness because of some cause that I support. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with the scriptures. It doesn't have to do anything to do with biblical morality. But I'm righteous because of this cause that I support. Hashtag whatever it is. It's a form of godliness, but it's without any power. No one's getting saved. Nothing's even getting changed. These are the things. These are Braxton Hicks. For the final great tribulation. Now as Christians I think it's important. We shouldn't be discouraged by these things. You should not be discouraged by these things. And I think, I think we get off the rails. Because we pay so much attention to what's going on in the culture. And we think oh man the sky is falling. We got, we got wars. We got, we got natural disasters. We got political division. We can't get along with anybody. Our family hates us. Right? It doesn't matter what position you take on anything. Somebody's going to hate you. Don't be discouraged. You should just treat it just the same as like the baby's coming. Oh, something good's about to happen. Something good is about to happen. Labor pains are a reminder that the end of the labor pains, it's coming. And at the end of the labor pains, the child is revealed. And in this case, the child is Jesus Christ. He's coming. It's not something to dread. Something to be aware of. Something that ought to cause you to actually have more Christian enthusiasm for the work of the kingdom in the day in which we live because we're certainly much closer today than we were in Paul's day. For believers, this is also going to mark a time, as our text tells us, of great rescue. Great rescue. 
I've, I, I've, I've read things and I've heard things that people are so critical about evangelicals or the Christian church today because they say, oh, you know, people who focus on the need for others to get saved. Well, we're just focused on we're selling fire insurance, they say. Have you ever heard that? It's like, it's kind of true. It's like, I, I don't want people to die and go to hell. I, I don't. And you shouldn't either. And that shouldn't motivate us to share the gospel with people. And it is insurance. Right? We're going to be rescued. I, I like that. I'm looking forward to that. Look at what it says. He says, at that time, at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Not my words. This isn't my program. It's God's program. Your people there. Now he's talking specifically about Israel. Of course. Of course we're rescued. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Actually, we're already rescued at the time that this all happens. When the great tribulation comes, we're out of here. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But at the beginning... Uh, that, that'll happen at the beginning or just before the beginning of the tribulation. But uh, when we're raptured, when the church is gone, there's going to be this great void in the world. I mean, think about it. I mean, have you guys ever given any thought to this? Like, like your car and your house and your bank account, if you have a bank account. You know, everything that's yours will just be left behind. And no doubt if you have un, unbelieving you know, uh, family members, they're going to swoop in and take it all. But, but there's going to be this incredible void of just stuff that's left behind. In a sense, I, I think a lot of the culture is going to celebrate when the church is gone. Because as we see more and more and more, we stand in their way. I mean, who else is standing in their way? In regard to the, 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 the morals that they want to foist upon the culture, the direction that they want to take you and your kids and the country and the world, there's only one group really that stands in their way. Well, there are the Muslims, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. But we stand in the way in the sense of we stand for righteousness. We stand for what the Bible says. There's a, a certain part of the, the, the population that's going to rejoice, but there's also going to be millions, millions who are on the fence today who will come to faith in Christ during that time. And, and this is the importance of our witness. Right? This is why it's important that your friends and family and loved ones that don't know Christ know about Christ, that you tell them, that you share the faith with them. Because even if they don't come to faith in your lifetime or before all this goes down, millions are going to come to faith after the rapture. Unfortunately, though, those will enter into the tribulation and they will be martyred. We see them pictured in Revelation chapter 7. John says, I... After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. John didn't know who these people were. He just had this vision. He saw all these people from all over the world. He saw them standing before the throne. They're obviously saved. They're, they're in white robes. And so he asked the angels, who are these people? And the angel told him, verse 14, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're coming out of the tribulation, but they're going to be martyred. Now the ones here mentioned in Daniel, they're, they're the remnant of Israel, those who come to faith. Those who come to faith in Jesus during the Great Tribulation, many, many will come, Gentile and Jew, will come to faith in Christ during that time. But of the Jews specifically, 
Uh, turn over to Zechariah chapter 12, the second to the last book in the Old Testament. These beautiful verses the prophet wrote about this day and the way God was going to be moving in the, the last day, specifically with the nation. Zechariah 12, starting with verse 9, it says, In that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. It's an incredible prophecy. It's an incredible picture that Jesus Christ himself in the last days will be visible. And and they will mourn. They will mourn over him. In chapter 13, it says, and and it will come about in in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts of it will be cut off and perish. But the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire. Refine them as silver is refined. And test them as gold is tested. And they will call on my name. And I will answer them. And I will say they are my people. And they will say the Lord is my God. There's going to be a great rescue. God is, God is going to rescue people. Even in the last days. Look at verse 2 in our text. It says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. This is a great rescue, or a great resurrection. Right? It's part of the great rescue, but there is a great resurrection. Everyone, everyone will be raised at some point. It, It tells us, There are those who who will awake to everlasting life and then those who will awake to disgrace and everlasting contempt. But there will be a resurrection of the dead. I think think one one of the great lies of the devil is that people die and there's nothing. That's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. No, you're an eternal soul. You were created an eternal soul. Even those who have rejected Christ They have an eternal soul. Not an eternal body, but an eternal soul. You go on living after you exit this body. Death is not final. There are those, even even in the Christian community, there are those who believe in this doctrine of annihilationism. That that no, there's no heaven, there's no hell, we just cease to exist. Or, Or certainly those, I'm sorry... The, the annihilationists believe that those that are destined for hell just cease to exist. It's not what the scripture teaches. I don't know where they get that. And it's not a, it's not a new doctrine. It's not just a New Testament doctrine. The idea of resurrection has been around forever. Job talked about it. Job uh, thought to be the first, the first scripture ever written. Look at what Job says, 19, uh, 25 and 26. As for me, I know... I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Man, I'll tell you, just look at that sentence. It's filled with doctrine. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my God is alive and will stand on the earth. That's incredible. And he goes on. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I shall see God. I think that's resurrection. There's no other, there's no alternative. It's like he he knows that his flesh is going to be destroyed. Just like all of us, your flesh is going to go away. But there's this sense that from your flesh, you will see God. What is that talking about? It's talking about resurrection. You'll be resurrected. You will have a body. What's it going to be like? I don't know. That's a whole nother study. And we don't really know all that. Will I be like a 20 year old Jim? Oh, I hope so. (laughs) Isaiah said it this way, again, Old Testament prophet, your dead will live. The corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy, 
For the dew is as the dew of dawn, the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. When you die, you exit your body, but you do not cease to live. And one day, you will be raised. But as this scripture indicates, indicates again, looking at verse 2, some will awake to everlasting life, but others to a different resurrection, actually a resurrection of death. There are two resurrections in this sense. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to do a little bit of flipping around here. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, Paul talks about this whole idea of the resurrection to life. 1 Corinthians 15, we're picking it up in verse 50. Uh, 50 through 53. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What he's saying there is, is this body that you're in, this body of flesh and blood, it's not fit for heaven. It's corrupt, right? It's, it's, it's corrupt because of sin and because heaven is a place of perfection, right? There is no sin in heaven. You can't, your body can't go there. You can't inherit it in this body. So he, he goes on. He says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Now, there you go. Verse 51 is, is one of those verses you look at. What is he talking about? We will not all sleep. Sleep is a reference to death. The, the physical death that we die, the separation from our bodies. We will not all sleep, he says. What is he talking about? Again, there's, there's an indication there of what we have as a hope and an expectation of the rapture of the church. Some will not die this physical death. But we all will be changed. In a moment, verse 52, in the twinkling of an eye. I love that language. It just seems like it's some kind of a, you know... Peter Pan kind of thing. It's, like, it's just some magical thing that happens. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, you're changed. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, doo -doo -doo, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Again, the, the dead are raised imperishable. Those who are on earth, they're changed in a moment, in a twinkling of eye. And then he explains it. This perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. You will have a body. It'll be a glorified body. It'll be a body fit for heaven. I don't, I don't know what that is going to look like, but it's going to be great. It's going to be glorious. Turn over to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. This is where we see this doctrine of the, the rapture and those things that are coming uh, to the church. 1 Thessalonians 4. Looking at verses uh, 13 through 18. Paul says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Again, when you read that idea of asleep, this is, what, this is the language that Jesus used when he was going to raise Lazarus. He said, Lazarus is asleep. And his disciples said, oh, well, then he'll just wake up. And he said, no, he's dead. All right? he, he was using this language to make a distinction. Hey, he's not gone in the sense of he's no, you know, no longer existing. He's just simply asleep, separated from the body. But here, he says, Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed uh, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. 
the dead in Christ are raised. At the same time that we are raised, in a sense, in the air, caught up. The Greek word harpazo means to be violently snatched away. We're going to be caught away, caught up to be with the Lord. And as it says, to be with the Lord forever. This This is incredible. This is what's going to happen to the church. Now, go to uh, Revelation chapter 20. Again, we're, we're talking about, it's, it's part of the great rescue, but, but this great resurrection that's happening. And it's, it's going to happen for, for, for everyone at one point or another. But uh, for believers, there are all these different groups that are kind of covered. So I want to look at Revelation 20, uh, verses 4 and 5, if I can get there. There we go. Uh, John says, I saw thrones, verse 4 of Revelation 20. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Now keep your now keep your 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 finger there, um, because we want to get back to this Uh, again. uh, In our text, there is this reference to some uh, rising to everlasting life, others to. Uh, what would amount to judgment. And here he's talking about, uh, this, is, this is the tribulation saints and those who come to faith, probably of the Jews, during that, that time. And, and clearly they're killed, right, if they don't take the mark. Right? This, is the, this is what the, 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 the government of the Antichrist is going to impose on people. You're going to take the mark or you're going to be beheaded. Uh, but these... They're, they're going to be part of that raising to life. Um, and it says in verse 5, the rest, the rest, that is those who are being raised to, to contempt, judgment, that's going to come later. Um, it says they didn't, they didn't come to life until the thousand years were completed. Now, uh, look at verse 13 of Revelation 20. This is this judgment. It says the sea, verse 13, Revelation 20, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. These are frightening verses. This is a resurrection unto death. A second death. People who have rejected Christ in their lifetime, they're going to be raised. And they'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And because of their rejection, they're rejecting rescue, they're rejecting salvation, they'll be judged for their sins. This isn't popular. People don't want to teach this. Look at verse 8. The cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the uh, murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, unrepentant, right? You've got to read into that a little bit. This is, these are unrepentant. Otherwise, it would include all of us. Their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Here's the point. There, everyone will be raised. Everyone will be raised. And, and the people who, who think they're getting away with living how they want, and, you know, I'm not going to bow to God, I'm not going to follow Jesus. It's serious. It matters what you believe. It matters what you believe. And, and, and it ought to, you know, we should not ignore these verses. It ought to add fuel to the fire, so to speak, even as we contemplate fire. It ought to add fuel to the fire in our Christian witness. These people need Jesus. 
You've got friends and family who this is their destiny if they don't receive Christ in their lifetime. Well, for us, I mean, for, for us as believers, we have a great future. And in spite of all these kind of like more dark things, like, oh, it's going to get difficult at the end. It's going to be all this. We're going to be rescued. Believers, those who are redeemed, as we sang earlier, we're going to live with Christ forever. We have a great future. Look at, look at what it says. Verse 3, those who have insight, not through our own wisdom, but by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It's beautiful. What's the picture there? It's the picture of believers living in glorified bodies. Right? It's a, it's a picture of us in heaven living, as it says, forever and ever. Transformed people, glorified, rescued, resurrected, living eternally with Christ. Never forget that. That's your future if you're a believer in Jesus. In spite of everything that's going to go on in the world from this day till the end, whatever the end looks like for all of us, you know, we're going to be with the Lord. We have a great future. Now, we still have a great mystery, right? We still have a great mystery. Look at, look at, look at what the angel tells Daniel in verse 4. As for you, Daniel... Conceal these words, seal up the book until the end time. Many will go uh, back and forth and knowledge will increase. Daniel, seal up the book. What, is that? what does that mean? Well, well, here, we see this over and over again. Daniel, Daniel doesn't understand all of this. He doesn't. And, and he would not live to see much of this. And, and over the ages... Uh, people have looked at these verses and, and, and not necessarily seen the things that we see. There has been this sense that God has incrementally revealed these things. Like we, we just talked about the doctrine of the rapture. People who, you know, there are lots of theologians who don't, they reject the idea of the rapture. And one of the reasons why they do is because it's not historic. And they say, well, even though Paul said these things, the church throughout history hasn't necessarily believed that. But we look at it, I look at it, and just go, how could you not? We will be caught away and forever be with the Lord. What, what, how, what do you... But it's been revealed. Even the attention to prophecy itself, it's actually something that's been fairly recent in the history of the church, that we'd be looking at these things, that we'd be hoping in the future. Even this, this book of Daniel. I've told you over and over again, so many theologians throw it away. They say, oh no, it's too accurate. It couldn't be. No, we, we see it. And then we look, we look back at history. What they couldn't see as history unfolded, we can now look back. At, we have this great privilege of being able to look back and go, oh, that's what happened and that's what happened. And that's, it's exactly what it says. So it was sealed up for a time, but then revealed in the last days. Now, he, the angel gives him an indication of, of, of what this, some of the things that will be happening. He says many will go back and forth. What does that mean? People are going to go back and forth. It, it, it has the idea of travel. People are going to be going from one place to the other, back and forth. Have you seen that? Like, like, it's incredible. Again, put yourself into the mindset of Daniel or even the early disciples. These guys traveled by foot. They walked. It's like, it's like you when you used to walk, you know, four miles to school, uphill both ways in the snow, barefoot. You know, it's like they walked. They walked. It's, it's one of those things that you have to read into all of this stuff. The time it took to travel, they walked. Or, or maybe they had a donkey or a horse or a camel or something. But it was slow. Nowadays, are you kidding me? I mean, for thousands of years, that was the way people traveled. But in the last 120 years... 
we've got automobiles. At one point, when all my kids were home, we had like five cars in the driveway. The automobile was invented. In 1920, there were, it were, were, were right around there, there, there was, I'm sorry, in 1920, there were 8 million, in the United States, there were 8 million registered vehicles. By the end of that decade, there were 23 million. Today, there's nearly 300 million registered vehicles in the United States alone. And what are we doing? Boom, 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 boom. And some of you now with electric vehicles doing it silently even. We're, we're traveling. Do you ever just stop and just think about what was this like? Maybe do this next time you're stuck in traffic on 172nd. What was this? I think about it sometimes when I'm going through on Highway 9. Like at some point, this was a dirt road. At, at some point, it was just a, it was a, a path for horses. And not that long ago. But again, it's kind of like that, that image of childbirth. It, it's, it starts out slow, but then it increases in frequency and intensity. This going about back and forth, it has it has seriously increased in the last 100 plus years. I mean, we're flying all over the place. You can get on a plane today and be on the other side of the world tomorrow. It's crazy. Something that was unimaginable to previous generations. We just kind of take these things for granted. In 2016 alone, there were something like 7 trillion air travelers just going back and forth, back and forth, all over the globe. Certainly, this is fulfilled in our day. And then there's this idea of knowledge, knowledge increasing. I just think about how much we know, and I'm, I'm thankful for so much that we know, especially in the area of medicine, right? In the areas of science and medicine where, you know, we, we can do things that, you know, I mean, they used to do bloodletting, you know, they used to do all kinds of crazy things because they didn't have the knowledge that we have now. I mean, doctors and nurses, they can save people's lives that otherwise there was no hope because of the advancements and the things that we know on the molecular level, medically, there's things that we know in all kinds of different technologies. We know what's going on in the universe, or at least we think we do. We, we, have, we have a massive amount of knowledge that, that smartphone that you have, it's, it's, it's multiplied times more sophisticated than the, than the computers that guided the Apollo missions. You know that, right? You've heard that. And the computers that used to fill rooms, your smartphone is, is multiplied times faster in its processing capability. Like millions and millions of times faster. We have access to information like no one ever in the history of the world. Now, it doesn't mean we're any smarter. It doesn't mean we have any more wisdom. But knowledge has increased like crazy. Certainly in our lifetime. And so what the angel is saying is, hey, Daniel, just write this down. You won't get this. You're not going to get this. But at some point, some people in the future, they'll be able to read this prophecy and they'll go, wow, we're close. These things are happening now. Knowledge is going to increase. People are going to go to and fro. Let's finish the verses 5 through 13 here. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on that bank of the river. One said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long will it be till the end of these wonders? I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river, and he raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. As soon as uh, they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. As for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. From the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, 
there will be 1,290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1,335 days. But as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. One of the things that we see over and over as we study these different world leaders as we've gone through the study of Daniel is kind of thematically one of the things that God has shown every one of them is that their time is limited, right? Their, their, their time is allowed by God, first of all, right? The, there's this sense of humbling for all the world leaders. Hey, you only have this position because God gave it to you and you only have it for a limited amount of time. And then you're going to go away and be replaced by somebody else. And, and this actually is really hopeful uh, the, the reign of the Antichrist, and this is the understanding of this, is for time, times, and half a time. It's for three and a half years. That, that's the idea here. The, the Antichrist, as powerful as he is, a, a, as powerful as he will be as a final world ruler, he has a limited amount of time, three and a half years, that's it. Yeah, he'll be in power for seven, but really, that last, the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, it's just a, it's a short amount of time. In Daniel 7, 25, it says this, he will speak out against the Most High, wear down the saints of the highest one. Again, you get the idea. He, he's going after believers, certainly after Israel. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law. They will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit for judgment and his dominion will be taken away and annihilated and destroyed forever. Hallelujah. Jesus spoke about those days and, the, and the, 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 the reason for the brevity of the days. In Matthew 24, 22, he says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And it's this, again, you, you've got this kind of vague idea of time, times, and half a time. But then in other places, it's, it's made so clear that we're talking about three and a half years. Revelation 13, 5 is one of those verses. It says, there was given to him, the Antichrist, a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Now, anytime we're reading these, whether we're talking about the seven years or the three and a half years or the 42 months, it's based in the Babylonian calendar, which ex existed in the time the prophecy was delivered. So that was a 360 day year. Um, Daniel, clearly, you know, there, there's a lot of this that Daniel doesn't understand. Right? He's asking questions here at the end. He's like, well, what about, what, what's going to be the end of this whole thing? And what now exactly is going to happen? And, and some of it, it's like, hey, it's sealed up. It's closed up to the end. Uh, you're, you're not necessarily going to know what's going on. Uh, but here's the, here's the program. There's going to be a purging, as it says in verse 10. A purging and a purifying and a refining. The wicked are going to act wickedly. And they're not going to get it. But those who have insight will the, those who belong to Jesus right those who are looking to God looking to us they're going to get it we're going to get it at least insofar as the things that we need to know and and I would say for whatever there is here that's uncertain or that there is somewhat of a mystery about it's enough right it's enough to know what we do know and that is that Jesus is coming so uh, the three and a half years 42 months or 1260 days. That's the, that's the last part of the seven year period of tribulation. But then we're told there's 1290 days. What? So by what count, what is this all about? And, and Daniel doesn't know. And I would just say this plainly, we don't know. We don't know. This is like, what's with these numbers now? Because there's another 30 days. And then there's another 45 days. What, there's there's a, this 1290 days and then there's this 1335 days and and boy if you attain to the 1335 days that's awesome what are we talking about you have to just think about what's what's happening and and here's what's what's happening 
the Antichrist's reign ends at three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. And, and you can mark the beginning of that. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, it says he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. That's the abomination of desolation. That's where the Antichrist, in, in what we understand is a restored temple in Jerusalem, he stops the sacrifice and says, oh, by the way, I'm God. At that point, 1260 days is counting down. And then his reign will be over. And so you got, okay, what's going to happen the next 30 days, the next 45 days? What's that all about? Well, here's what's happening. First of all, Jesus is here, and he's beginning to set up the millennial reign. And so all we can do is speculate that he's just forming a government. Like, like he's putting something together that we don't have. Some kind of government that's going to rule the world with him on the throne. And and, you know, a lot of things happen, like, like the changing of, of, of our bodies in the twinkling of an eye. This evidently is going to take some time. That's, that's what a lot of people think they see here, is this is going to be the establishing of Jesus' rule over the earth. And it's going to just take this amount of time. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's, it's really one of the only explanations that I've read that makes any sense at all. But how wonderful is it to just imagine a government, a government that governs the world with Jesus on the throne. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Now, the angel gives this final uh, direction to Daniel, even though he doesn't get everything. He says, as for you, go your way to the end. Then you're going to enter into your rest and you'll rise again. At your allotted, uh, for your allotted portion at the end of the age. The language there, go your way until the end. It's not talking about the end of the age. He's talking about the end of his life. Basically, I think the angel is telling Daniel, uh, just finish your life. Go about, go about your business in the manner in which you've been living. What's Daniel been doing? What have we seen Daniel do throughout all of this? It started... It started with him as a teenager. And all he's done is serve God. All he's done is stood against, stood against one evil dictator after another. Served them. By God's grace, he's been allowed to serve them. But he's also not compromised. He's not compromised. He's been a man of the word. He's been a man of prayer. He's been a man who's not afraid to speak up. He's had an incredible influence on his own culture, the Babylonian culture, leader after leader after leader. Daniel has behaved righteously in his day. And the angel just says, you just keep going. At a certain point, you're going to die. And at the end of the age, you're going to be raised. And you're going to enter into glory. It's great instruction for all of us. What are we supposed to do? Be like Daniel. Seriously, we... We live in a time of, of so much chaos, so much craziness. What are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to enter into the, the you know, fighting politically and fighting, you know, fighting against the culture? Good luck with that. I mean, you should be engaged with the culture. You should be engaged with politics. But you should be serving Jesus. He's the one who's coming. Right? It's, it's his kingdom that's coming. It's, it's the establishment of his rule. You know, there's some churches that believe that the Christian church is going to take over the world. That that's the millennium. Is that, that somehow we are going to take over politically and mil, military, mil, militarily and, and just kind of rule the, the world. Do you see that happening? No, I just, I just think this is a, a, a reminder for us to finish our lives, to run our race well, to serve the Lord, be involved in serious matters. You know, be, be involved like Daniel in matters of prayer, knowing that when you pray, you're entering into battle. Live your life in a way, understanding and knowing that after the church is gone, those people who knew about your faith, they will be affected 
Like people, massive amounts of people are going to come to faith in Christ because of the witness of the church. Hopefully because of my witness and your witness. But then always, always, don't be discouraged about what's coming. Look forward to it. It's glory. Father, thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the example of Daniel. How he, he lived righteously in a wicked day. God, I pray that you would inspire us by your spirit, by your word. Lord, that we would rise to the occasion. People need to hear about Jesus today. Use us, Lord, for your glory. Use us, Lord, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces. Lord, may we, as the Bible says, may we be ambassadors of Christ. A witness to the world. And may many, many come to know you because of our testimony. Thank you, God, that we have a glorious future. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray.